We're joined today by Fred Schott, the creator of Snowpack, and i um, super excited to have you on, Fred. Yeah, pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Uh, as, as is customary, why don't we have you start out by telling us what Snowpack is, and, and maybe I should be saying Snowpack.js, and, um, and then we'll go into how it came to be. Yeah, happy to. Um, it's been a pretty exciting project that's been around a lot longer than I think people think. It, uh, it came out of a uh, more like research experimentation project I started called Pika, which uh, some people still know it by. It was essentially just a way to look at um, modern JavaScript as a way to speed up dev tooling and, and dev essentially everything the developer touches. Um, Snowpack came out of that as a way to speed up your build tooling. So it's a uh, build tool similar to like a Webpack or a Rollup, but it leverages these modern advances that have kind of come out after, over the last five years but that hadn't really made their way into tooling. Um, we really lean into those advances and essentially designed the tool for this modern world. And through that, we end up with a much faster dev experience. So you can start off this dev server, you know, build your site, essentially get live in development in less than uh, 50 milliseconds. And every change is essentially instant because we're only rebuilding individual files. So you make a change, save it, and then we essentially push that update directly to your application. So you see that change live essentially instantly. Got it. Yeah. I, I became aware of Snowpack first through the Svelte uh, universe. Uh, I, you know, Svelte has new efforts in place that put Snowpack kind of at the center um, and, and stumbled into Snowpack that way. I imagine we'll, we'll cover that soon. Um, but yeah, I, I wasn't aware it was so old. That's interesting. Well, it's not it's not ancient, but you know, oh, in the world of modern dev tooling, right. it certainly is. <laughs> but the, but the you know, it's it's not. Uh, it, it wasn't created yesterday. It's, it's good. Yep. Yep. Yeah. The Svelte eco, the Svelte community is really interesting because they are definitely a more modern uh, framework. So they don't have a lot of the legacy that like a React does, where um, someone building with React, you all of a sudden you start to use these kind of older packages or these older dependencies that don't really work as well in a modern world. Um, so you kind of see a little bit more kind of fiddling that you need to do in those ecosystems, but Svelte is just like, everything's modern. It's a really nice dev workflow. So just from a terms of the ecosystem, that, uh, community has really been able to connect to this, uh, new dev tool and this new story, um, in a really cool way. Great. Well, I imagine the snowpack story maybe is in some ways your story, but t take us back to, to, uh, snow snowpack's beginning and however far back you need to go. Yeah, so back in, I mean, really, really started looking at this back in like 2016, 2017. So um, that's kind of the fun part about this project is that we're using like what is modern technology, but it's not, it's stuff that actually has been like really kind of ironed out even earlier than that. So, you know, back in 2015 and even earlier, there was this idea of uh, standardizing a module format in JavaScript. So like a way for the browser itself to actually like, okay, I'm loading this file and okay, this file depends on this file and that depends on this, like a, a native way to kind of load a full application um, without any sort of, you know, extra tooling needed, all native. Um, that was an idea that kind of got ironed out and then standardized and finalized around 2015. Um, so it kind of, and everything in the browser takes a while to kind of work its way into the ecosystem. So over those first few years, it was in modern browsers, but most users weren't on those modern browsers. So you kind of ended up with like, you can use it sometimes, but like your users can't. So we've, for the last five years, been in a way of like, you build this way, but then you have to do all this tooling to like handle it for everyone else, uh, like that backwards compatibility. But I was lucky to be working at Google at the time on a, a project called Polymer that was very, very future looking. So it was within the Chrome team. Um, essentially, it was a way to look at web components, but we also spent a lot of time thinking about tooling and dev tooling as well and, and ESM, um, this, this new native way to load code um, in the browser. So. Through that, I got experience with this this new format and this new system. Um, I, I ended up leaving Google around 2016, 2017, and uh, went to go work at a company called Ripple. And through there, then kind of got to revisit these technologies now, like from the outside looking in. So Pika as an experimentation really came out of that. And that was this idea of like, let's just look at this technology and and run some experiments. Let's, let's try new things. Um, so we'd worked on a code editor for a while. Um, uh, Snowpack came out of this project called Pico Web, um, which was a way to work with these packages. Um, there was a, a search catalog. There's all these kind of cool, interesting experiments that have like through the years, some of them have kind of gone away and some of them have become what is now Snowpack and uh, the company I started last year, which is Skypack, which is a way to 
essentially load um, load code from a, a global CDN. Yeah, that was what kind of brought me to Snowpack was that the early experience with the technology and then the realization that there was a missing part of that technology. Just it was out. It had lived for a few years out in the world, but no one was really taking advantage of it. Um, that we could build better tooling by just leveraging something that was, you know, by 2018 actually had kind of lived out in the world for a, a while now. So I have to admit, I you know, I'm familiar from the developer experience, uh, in, you know, npm installing things and and having a whole bunch of stuff in my node modules. Uh, but what you're talking about is at runtime when when the user downloads, uh, you know, pulls up a website, a bunch of JavaScript gets downloaded. Help me understand further how, how Snowpack is changing things. It's taken us a while to get to what you're describing is essentially what we just released. So it's this kind of our next stance on what the future of web development looks like, which is the idea of instead of having a lot of stuff that you run locally, just as you're developing Snowpack and kind of fetch the code that you want. Um, that you might be depending on and kind of do that live and invisibly so you don't need to worry about a big node modules folder or a lot of tooling that you need to work on on top of what you're just trying to build for your application. Trying to make it invisible and really seamless and on demand is the goal. Okay, so so the, the, the original or, or kind of early versions of Snowpack address runtime and you're saying this newest version also kind of pulls in some of that magic to the, to the development time. Yeah, we've kind of worked our way up to this exactly. So the early stuff was just taking a look at um, as the Webpack or Rollup or Create React App or even Next.js, like all of these other tools follow this model where as you're building, a lot of tooling is like essentially bundling and processing your entire application and then shipping it to the browser, which means that like as your project grows and grows, those tools are having to do more and more work. It doesn't actually scale well into a big project. It's more and more upfront work. Um, so splitting that up and 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 focusing on individual files versus entire applications, that was kind of the first vision for Snowpack as a dev tool. This idea that you don't need to do all this processing and bundling, you can just kind of work on individual files, build individual files, and ship those to the browser. And, and that way it scales really nicely. It, it gets that fast startup time on small projects and large projects because you're only ever building what gets loaded. So if you have a thousand pages on your website, you're still only building the one that you just loaded in development. Um, so it's really efficient that way. This new version three of Snowpack takes that same kind of idea where it's, if you're not actually gonna load a package, um, some dependency, why are you doing this upfront work to get those all prepared and ready to go? Why not just pull it in on demand? Um, and at that point, then why are you even running NPM install at all? Why not just let Snowpack pull it in on demand? So we, by leveraging the, the CDN that we've built called Skypack, um, you can essentially get any package as pre-bundled, pre-built, ready to go JavaScript. So that whole like folder that's within your node modules and all of its dependencies are just turned into JavaScript. And that's, at the end of the day, what we've always really wanted in the front end application is just give me JavaScript that I can send to a user. So it gets rid of all this indirection to just give you, you know, for React, here's a react.js, here is React fetched from our CDN and then running in your application almost instantly. So you're really stealing Apple's business. I no longer need a terabyte, <laughs> two terabyte hard drive to to, de to do front end development. That? <laughs> if we're stealing from anyone, it's just like the way we did web development, like way back in the day, which is this idea of like actual scripts. And because there was no tooling around, you had to like you had a hundred different you know script tags that would get loaded, and maybe you added some structure to that in the loader. But we're really just like you know the idea that React is actually a React.js, like a JavaScript file, is a really old idea that we just kind of reconfigured for today. Yep. Awesome. And is yeah. this a, no is new it, ideas in the world, just <laughs> constantly reinventing old ones. And is this, was this like a personal pain point for you? I, I mean, it, so at Google, you were kind of producing tools. You weren't necessarily like building sites and, and running into these issues, maybe at Ripple or? Um, yeah, this is like something that all web developers have, have felt, um, I think, or I don't want to speak for everyone, but like time and time again, you just kind of get used to it, like, well, this is the way web development is. There's, all this like slow processing and I make a change and I kind of wait for my, like the idea of your deadly, your computer spinning up these like fans to cool, like what is a really intense tooling process. Um, I think combining that with the knowledge like that hasn't always been the way it's been. Um, having worked on projects even before Webpack was a thing, like you had this really snappy, everything's a JavaScript file, so there is no work to be done. It just gets sent to the browser. So it was kind of like we had this really fast dev experience. We then, wanted to unify everything as a community around Node.js and NPM 
And so to do that, we kind of brought in this tooling, but we had a pretty good setup in terms of like speed before that tooling was in place. And so this project has been trying like, is there a way to kind of square these two ideas, have the great ecosystem that is NPM, modern web development, but with the same features of an older world where you're just working with JavaScript files already. So you're not having to do all this processing. Um, like the idea that you have to like, okay, made a change. I'm going to wait for this to rebuild and recompile. That's like such a JavaScript never had that problem. It was like one of the, like the few things that JavaScript had to be able to like, you know, look at others and be like, ha, ah, we don't have that problem. Um, and then all of a sudden we did. So it's been kind of a, a journey back to basics or back to what we used to have and seeing how we could fit that together. And, and now tell us how, how the kind of rollout or adoption has gone. You've been doing this for a few years, um, uh, Skypack for, I think it was last year you mentioned. How has this kind of started getting traction? Where are the communities where it sticks? Yeah, so definitely more modern, like the kind of more modern, the ecosystem. Um, and the more modern, like even the developer, if you like to work with modern tools, you kind of already have an advantage here where... Um, you're maybe familiar with this idea of ESM and native modules in the browser. So there's a little bit less that will feel unfamiliar. Um, and then Svelte being an ecosystem that's more modern, it, it kind of all already works out of the box versus having to kind of fiddle with configuration to get older packages and older um, systems in play. Um, it's really basically, you know, one of the ideas is how to move you know, an ecosystem that is so built up on how Webpack works. Like, the first thing you learn when you start to build tools like this is like, oh God, everything in the ecosystem was kind of designed for Webpack and the specifics of how you know this dominant tool did things. Um, people weren't writing saying that it was like natively correct. They were writing saying that it was like Webpack correct. And that, that difference is kind of subtle, but ends up then influencing the whole direction of the community. Um, so a lot of this project has been both education of package authors, realizing that their things only work in a certain tool that is now becoming one of many options for developers, you know, Webpack versus Rollup versus Snowpack. Um, it's a whole ecosystem now. Um, so we've seen the, the whole kind of NPM ecosystem really get more modern over the last couple of years um, in a way that they hadn't really in the previous years because this was also new. It's now much more better understood, better educated, better documented. Um, they're not necessarily new ideas anymore. And and maybe you can help us understand who 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 else has helped kind of bring uh, Snowpack into life. I've I've mentioned Rich at Svelte. Are there others? Yeah. So the Svelte community and, and Rich's work with SvelteKit, which is their new Sapper, their new kind of application, um, has been really instrumental. Our our server side rendering engine that we just released in V three of Snowpack was actually really heavily you know essentially grabbed out of <coughs> SvelteKit. So okay. Rich built this like wildly impressive like very like weird but also super useful way to turn any sort of front-end code into something that could actually be loaded into node so okay. instead of rebuilding it like essentially just like import it from node through this pipeline and you get front-end code running on the server mm -hmm. um so rich built that because he needed it in svelte kit in his work and then essentially was like this might make more sense in snowpack in a, in a kind of more open-ended where anyone could use it setting so that partnership has been really instrumental um I'm trying to think there's another, there's a really cool project called Microsite, which is using Snowpack to power um, this really interesting idea called partial hydration. So the idea of, you know, building an application and sending it to the user, um, it can get expensive. And so mm -hmm. this project by uh, someone named Nate Moore is looking at what if we could actually just render the site and then get rid of all that code that you're sending. So essentially server render, but now we're actually not even sending anything that is no longer needed, essentially stripping out everything that's already been rendered from the code. So the code you ship to the browser gets really, really minimal um, compared to what it was kind of originally written to generate the site in the first place. You kind of partially hydrate the site. Um, so yeah. there's all these projects that are building on top of what we've what we've made where, you know, it's essentially we're just trying to create a new foundation, a faster, more efficient foundation. And then all the same stuff can can be moved over. Like a Next.js could be rewritten for Snowpack. Um, but you could also start to reimagine new types of tooling that wouldn't be possible without this native module loading that Snowpack really leverages. So yeah, it's the, the analogy I use is like it's like the ninth inning of this Webpack story. There's like a really mature tooling ecosystem around it, yeah. and Snowpack and these ideas of ESM were like first inning. Like there is so much greenfield, so much stuff that can be built out as we explore and learn kind of what's new and what's possible. Yeah, so maybe take us to you know the beginning of releasing Snowpack. You you push this thing out into the world, and you know maybe there's not 
uh, consumers on day one, but you've got to go find kind of the riches it's felt, or maybe they find you and, and you find uh, this fellow at microsite. Is that, is that kind of how the, how it works or do they come out of the woodwork? Yeah, it's, um, I was lucky that I, I, I connected early on with a story that other people felt. So yep. it was this like pain of like modern development has gotten really complicated yeah. and slower than it feels like it needs to be. Like we all kind of knew that, but like there wasn't a really easy fix to it because it was ingrained in the technology that you had to do all this work. So um, part of it was just looking at efficiency um, as a like conceptual thing that like should be solved for, but also as like a real pain point that developers have. Um, building this out was not like what is today's snowpack was not the first vision. So the, the first vision was just, let's take a look at a really small piece of this, which was yeah. your packages. So the reacts and the react maybe button that you pulled in. Um, it was this understanding of how to scope it, which, which really fit in well with the idea of those packages are the only things that are actually keeping us back, holding us back from this modern world. Mm -hmm. You can write this modern code today that takes advantage in the browser. And then, as long as you have modern packages, that's that's it. You're now in the modern world. Okay. Um, so it was this idea of if we could tackle the biggest pain point first and let you kind of do a little bit more of the work where you had to kind of build a modern tool yourself, but we would fit into that tool. Um, that was our first group of users was we were just a piece of a puzzle that they had to put together themselves. Yeah, yeah. Um, but from there, we then Snowpack became the full puzzle, the full yeah. integration of your packages, your own code. and creating a dev environment that, that worked across the, the spectrum of apps. And uh, at some point along the way, you start thinking maybe there's a business here, Skypack comes into the picture, or, or I mean, tell us, how, how, what, what's the debate like that? Like, what do I do now that this thing's kind of taking off? Yeah, it's it's an important clarification. Like, Snowpack is not the business. Snowpack is a really fun tool, It's but yeah. it's completely open source. Um, you know, it's, it's not, we're not trying to charge anyone for a, an open source build tool. It's, it's very much just something that we really enjoy and see should exist mm -hmm. in the world. Um, but Skypack was the other side of Pico, which was what does this new ecosystem look like? And, and really kind of keeping an open mind of what are the tools, but also what are the services that exist in this new world? Like what does, um, you know, the NPM of this new ecosystem look like? What yeah. does, um, you know, the next JS, what does hosting, like all of these different pieces of a web development puzzle. Um, we really tried to go into that question open with open eyes. Um, so like the early version of, of Pika, originally, I think we were we were really looking at what does like a GitHub for packages look like? Like let's let's yeah. let's you know replace GitHub and everything and like to create a whole new world. Um, it was really ambitious and like really difficult. Yeah. Um, but through that work, we realized, well, really, it's the modern part of this is the access to those packages. That's what needs to be tackled first. Okay. Is, I have a package and it's all these different files and maybe it was written seven years ago, so it will never run directly in a modern environment. But Pika's CDN was getting a lot of traction as a way to kind of up convert those packages um, in a way that anyone could load from them. So the CDN is a way that you could load any package and get back a single modern file. That was an idea that people really connected to. Um, and both in terms of like, oh, this is cool. I, I don't even need a build tool at all. I can just in my application import from a URL and I'm now working on code that will run directly in the browser. Um, so we're still figuring out what that means. I mean, it's a wide open world, but there's clearly a story here that a CDN provides for, which is, again, it's an old story. The idea of like jQuery had a CDN back in the day and yep. there's this like point of pride to have your own CDN as a product yeah. you kind of made it. Um, we're, we're seeing how far we can take that idea into the modern world, which is um, running a CDN, providing code and then trying to connect more and more developers to this more modern way of thinking. Got it. So S Snowpack's got its own life as a modern build tool. Build tool and in, in, in the same ecosystem, you found a place for a uh, Skypack to uh, be this CDN to deliver your packages. Yeah. So we're just excited about what people are building with that as like, you know, it's just like, we've seen the future, it all fits together, but like, who are the players? What does it look like? What are you building in that world is still, um, Again, it's the first ending of the story, so we're really excited by by the progress we're seeing. Yeah, yeah. One question on this future world. Um, I I hope I don't derail this too much, but Dino is is another like like when we talk about Skypack, um, that lives also kind of in the Dino universe. Um, does Snowpack have have like where does Dino and Snowpack begin? Um, do they have complementary place? Yeah, they're they're more similar, I think. 
um, then at least we all realized as the people building these things, like yeah. I, I've only chatted briefly with the people behind that project, but that idea of importing things by URL, that's, that's the technical innovation that this module system provides. So they're leveraging that same technology, but for a different use case, which is server side code. So really same spiritual roots. Um, yep. We share a lot of the same beliefs in how we see JavaScript evolving, but them tackling the server side and us tackling the front end. So you can think of Snowpack as kind of giving you a lot of deno ideas, but in a more traditional node uh, front end world. Um, like if you like the things that Deno is doing, you will definitely like Snowpack. Like you can import by URL in Snowpack if you want to. Um, but I think where the real innovation, where these two projects probably collide, maybe down the road less today, is there are people experimenting with front-end development in Deno. So the idea of writing a front-end application in a way that can run in Deno and in the browser, like it's the same exact code base. Um, I'm blanking on the name of it, but someone is working on a re uh, Next.js, um, essentially a competitor, it's the same, really borrows heavily from what they've done, but for Deno and because it's all browser native, you're writing code that runs in both places. So it's a really interesting idea that they're taking essentially to the extreme of like, we now have a runtime called Deno, which can run the same code as your browser. How does that change web development? I think that's a really interesting conversation. Yeah, that that, that is the, the, the kind of node versus uh, browser divide is, um an unfortunate situation of our time. Node, it, it's like it's been a very painful journey for Node to even add this modern ESM support. So that idea of import export in your Node.js code, it's, I mean, it's it's a migration of the entire underlying model of how a framework works. So the fact that they've even you know gotten as far as they have is really impressive. Um, but it's going to be a really tough journey for them because it's so much of the ecosystem. Ten years of development is built up, assuming one thing, and now they've they flipped it. They're doing as much as they can to support both, but at the end of the day, it's it's a really complex problem to solve. So, you know, Deno, I, it's it's easy to be the ones that just throw out the old and bring in the new. Like, you know, that's essentially what Snowpack has done. But um, Deno definitely gets to benefit from just not having to worry about that legacy in the same way where Node is really, really having to be intentional. And it's going to be probably a painful journey. Or at least there's more pain to come in terms of that migration. So, uh, you know, kind of advancing the conversation a bit. On this show, we have all kinds of open source projects and. Um, databases, data processing, uh, and, and among many of those governance becomes a big question. I, you know, you know, are you going to be an Apache or cloud native computing foundation, but in the front end, that doesn't seem to be, um, as big a concern. Maybe help me understand how you, how you kind of think about, uh, maturing the project governance and, and maybe help us all understand how the front end works in this uh, question. Yeah, it's, it's, I think the front end community and JavaScript community has an interesting relationship with companies and the idea of companies. Like there's plenty of people who just like bristle at the idea of it. And I think that there's a lot in open source's background where it's like companies have kind of always taken advantage of open source. Like how much, how many billions of dollars in, in value has been generated by open source companies um, or sorry, open source projects, even there, like that's a, that's a whole uh, mind shift. Open source projects within a company, um, taking that value, getting value out of that and not giving back to the community. Um, so it's it's a definitely, it's not a happy relationship, but it's one where there are still the incentives where people, open source tooling is, is still a great way to get ideas out there. Like if I had had to, um, if I'd had to sell Snowpack in the day one to make money, um, it would have been really tough to get adoption. And I think some projects are doing that today, but it's it's a tougher road to, to climb. You really need to be good at marketing in a way that I certainly was at the, it wasn't at the time. Yeah. Um, and then, so you have this weird relationship where companies are getting value. They're not really giving back the way they should. Um, and then plenty of people have experimented successfully with building companies around these open source projects. So you kind of have this weird, like the reality is that it's a, it's a valuable model, but the reality is also it's one that gets taken advantage of a lot and maintainers like myself and, and plenty of others get really burnt out as a result. Um, we're trying to do the right thing with this. So Snowpack being a, a separate project, um, we're releasing an open governance uh, document and kind of model that we're going to try and follow, like really trying to both support the community with the, you know, the, the company side of things as a way to support maintainers, support good work, um, both financially and just kind of with resources, um, whatever that looks like and whatever people need. Um, but it's tough. It's, you know, I, I couldn't be working on Snowpack um, full time without the company side of it sustaining my own work and sustaining kind of myself. So 
it's a problem that really doesn't have a good solution yet. And everyone's, everyone's trying to figure it out, but um, it's something we hope we can solve for um, at least within Snowpack. And then take us forward from here. Uh, I, I think I saw somewhere somebody saying that, you know, 2021 is like the year of snowpack or something. Maybe, maybe I'm just making that up. <laughs> it was probably me. I'm just like, yeah. I have my shadow accounts. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, there are bots out there. Fred's <laughs> I backing. think I saw that as well. Um, yeah, tell us what, what's in store for snowpack in 21. And then maybe I'll just make a plug. Yesterday, uh, as of the day we're recording this, you were on um, uh, speaking with GitHub about the future of the front end development, I believe. And, and, you know, I imagine Snowpack plays a role in that, but, you, you know, feel free to take us beyond 21 if you want as well. Yeah, that was, that was a really fun talk. If you, if you care about like the future of web development, it was, it was less about Snowpack and more like, what are these trends that are going to continue into the decade? Um, yeah, I got to touch on a lot. I mean, really the core concept of, of, I think how I have understood the last decade is, you know, we have this really nice model, which is a single page application. So, um, you know, you could think of a something like a create React app or this idea that I'm building a full website. It's HTML, it's CSS, it's JavaScript. I'm the front end developer and I'm building an application. And then I talk to backend services via a like really explicit contract of an API. Mm -hmm. um, it's this really nice organizational structure, especially within companies where it's like the UI application does this one thing, the backend service does this one thing. There's a really explicit communication. And then you could have multiple UI applications, a desktop app, a mobile app, a website, all sharing the same backend code. Um, it's a really nice model, but it has performance issues as we've kind of learned towards the later half of the decade where you're having to ship an entire application to the browser, to the user's device um, that they then have to render themselves. So on a low power device or a poor connection, mm, yeah. you end up with, you know, you're doing a lot of unnecessary work on the device that is low powered by definition. So it's a model that makes a lot of sense for the developer, but it doesn't make as much sense for the user, especially like where did they come from? You know, you, the, you come from a world where you're go to a website and it streams down exactly what you should be seeing. So it's not streaming down the code to generate what you should be seeing. It's the older model was a lot more efficient. You just gave the user the code to display. Um, I think that's going to be the big question of this decade, which is what does it mean to build a modern application in a way that is as nice to use as a developer, but is faster for the user. Um, you can think of Next.js as a, like a solution to that problem or an attempted solution to run more code on the server while still having you think in terms of a single front end application. So kind of blurring the lines where it's an application that runs on the server and on the device. Um, that's one way. I mean, other tools like other kind of older line, like Rails, not that it's old, but just kind of went out of fashion with a certain type of JavaScript developer because it wasn't a full JavaScript application. It truly blurred the lines. It was one server on Rails and your front end application was a part of it. Um, does that get a second look? Because now we're saying that to solve this performance concern, we need a server. Well, why not use Rails? Why not use something from, um, you know, from this model that was built for this model of blurring the lines? So, yeah, I, I, I don't give any good, good, satisfying answers, but I think it's a really important framing in that talk of just, you know, what does the future of that application model look like? Yeah, and 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 it sounds like all the the kind of exploration that is happening around the tools, including Snowpack, are right at the heart of that. Right? It's it's. Uh, between blurring the lines between um, what's happening in the browser, what's happening on the server, and um, giving developers a UX experience where, in some ways, they don't have to think about that, or at least they get the they get the portability and the choice. Yeah, there's this there's this dream of Skypack, which is not here yet, but it's saying that like our the, the the real vision of Skypack as a CDN, as a place where you can load packages from, is this idea that as a user, if you actually are a user browsing the internet and you're downloading things in production. Um, as a user, you're downloading things from Skypack. You're seeing those URLs. It means that sites can start to share common dependencies. So there's this idea where like, let's say you go to Facebook and Facebook uses React. Yeah. And, you know, <laughs> and let's say that they have decided to use Skypack as the way that they serve React. Um, that means that every other site around the internet, if a user has been to Facebook, and they use and and this other site also uses React, yeah. that user wouldn't have to redownload it. It would be a shared dependency that both sites leverage. So the, the phone or, the, or whatever device it can understand, oh great, I've already seen that, I've downloaded it, it's already saved, I'll just use that. Um, for a world of all of your dependencies, that ends up being like 90% of most sites. So there's this vision of the browser getting more efficient with sharing resources um, that Skypack is like directly tied into exploring. Um, whether that's us powering you know, all these different imports, I think that's a little unrealistic, but 
more, what does it mean? Can the browser be smart enough to see, okay, this is React from here and this is React from there. It's the same file. I don't need to re-download it every time I see it. Um, that's all tied into the vision of Skypack and the vision of this native module, this React.js as a file itself um, that we're really interested in exploring. That's super fascinating. Um, yeah, it is. It, you, you think about today, every website I go to, I'm downloading uh, the oh, same ninety percent of stuff. Every every your phone has yeah. React saved in twenty different places, probably yeah. hundreds of different places. Um, but because of the way we bundle it, it it's locked into this larger website. Like the assets are all bundled together, compressed, and compiled. So the browser has no way to share that. Yeah. Um, so that's that's a model that really gets me excited about you know, the web as an efficient way to only kind of sync the parts that you need of a site, get the code that is custom to this site, and then share all the common stuff across the internet. That's that's something that really gets me excited. Great. And then uh, back to the question of um, uh, Snowpack in twenty one. Um, what what you know what what do users look forward to? And, and maybe if there are listeners here who want to get involved, what do you know? What do they do? Yeah, um, it's a great time to get involved. So V three that we just launched um, was a lot of experiments that have now kind of been finalized and put into production, like ready kind of V3 use. So that idea of streaming your imports from a CDN like Skypack and skipping the whole, whole NPM install story, um, that's fairly new and, and, and there's a lot to kind of uncover now that we have that, what comes next. Um, bundling and how we build your site for production uses a brand new um, ES build bundler. So ES build is this really cool project. It's written in Go. Um, if you haven't had Evan from that project on the, on the program, you should, because it's a fascinating look at the other side of this, which is that we don't need to change the ideas of what we're building. We just need to build them in better ways. So it's a native um, compiled code bundler that is essentially like 100 to like 300 times faster than what Webpack is doing and what others are doing. Um, it's really, really fast. And so we're lucky we get to leverage that as a more modern tool. Yeah. We can kind of connect that into our thing. So now if you build a site with Snowpack, you get that you know 300x speed up. Um, there's all these really cool new ideas that we're exploring that are still just because they're released, it's still that day one mentality of like, well, what comes next? Um, so there's a lot of improvements we're going to be making on that over the next year of just solidif solidifying these ideas and exploring them even more uh, to build the best dev, you know, build tool that we can. And and where does the Snowpack community gather? Um, do you do you do events? Is it all Slack? What's the... um, it's all Discord is our main community. Okay. So yep. check out um, Snowpack.dev. It has links to all these things. Um, but we generally use Discord for just kind of the community itself. Um, shout out to that. That server is a lot of fun. And then GitHub is where we do our development. So there's discussions there and issues and pull requests, um, contributor guidelines, and soon to be a, a governance model um, to kind of, we're getting to the point where I can no longer maintain this. It's, it's gotten bigger than just me. So um, we're really excited about just bringing more people in to help maintain, help grow the project, um, and help kind of set the direction of, of where this goes from here. Fantastic. And then any anything you want to say about uh, Skypack? Um, I imagine there's there's some overlap between the people who are getting excited about Snowpack and those getting excited about Skypack. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you like the exploration of all this, um, you know, this is something that it's all fits together conceptually. So even though they're separate projects, you know, we're we are all people who are excited about this future. Um, we are hiring for Skypack. So if you're interested and this sounds exciting, please, you know, kind of drop me a line on Twitter or anywhere else. Um, we are you know, building the future of the web and it's a really exciting project to, to be a part of. Great, Fred, thanks so much. Um, th this is an exciting time and it's awesome that you're kind of in the middle of it and we get to hear your perspective. Um, good luck with 21. Yeah, thanks, you as well. Thanks for having me on. You can find today's show notes and past episodes at contributor.fyi. Until next time, I'm Eric Anderson, and this has been Contributor. <laughs>